So I, you'd think I'd never done this before. I know. It's a new year, right? Yeah. And a fight in there? I don't know. <laughs> Welcome. Fellowship of us and share God's love. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements. Ad board is on the 17th, where we'll be voting on those things. We'll be uh, recommending to the charge conference, which is the 21st. That's two weeks from today. And after church today, we have the potluck and then the unhanging of the greens. So after today, it's just plain old January. Do we have any other announcements? Any birthdays or anniversaries this week? My mother would have been 91 today. Wow. Still, 90 is a good run. <laughs> All right. On this Epiphany Sunday, let's start by singing uh, We Three Kings.
We gather wondering, where will we find the babe born in Bethlehem? <coughs> we will find the babe in the last of children, in the wisdom of our grandparents. We gather asking, where will we find the child of Christmas? We will find the child where the needy are gifted with hope, where the oppressed are set free. We gather wanting to know, where will we find the Christ who has come to us? We will find our hope where favor is overwhelmed by grace, where hatred is overwhelmed by love, where all people are overwhelmed by joy. Dennis is at the Chicago Hope Cancer Center retreat, receiving specialized treatment to... Yes, it, it's, you stay in a hotel, but then the treatment, it's not a hospital, but you go during the day and you get your cancer treatments to go back to the hotel, okay. which is right there. <coughs> okay. So your daughter's dog? Yeah, it's Madison, my niece. So oh, your niece, Madison? Yep, Georgia. 
Thomas and Dr. Georgia is in for treatment for Lyme's disease. It's really affecting my father because of the sclerosis. Yep. Prayers for all of us. All right, let's be in a time of prayer. Abba, we belong to you. And it is good to have this time and this place and these people with whom to gather to be reminded of that. You have blessed us in many ways, O oh God. Here at the end of the season of Christmas, as we enter the season of Epiphany, <coughs> We ponder our own journeys, following our own stars, trying to find you in our lives again. And we ask for your guidance on that journey. And when we go off the way, that you might gently nudge us back onto it. We also pray for those who are in need today, O oh God, the poor, the outcast, those who live in areas ravaged by war and violence, Those whose bodies, minds, hearts, or souls are in need of healing. Guide the hands of those who care for them all. Move the hearts of the violent towards peace. And send your Holy Spirit to bring wholeness again. Lord, it is good in all things and in every way to give thanks to you. And this we do in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread.
Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, <coughs> saying, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went on their way, and the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw, saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. The word of God for the people of God. Will you please join with me in the prayer to the Holy Spirit? Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by that same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy your consolation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. What is the longest journey you have ever been on? A physical journey? A trip to Germany. A trip to Germany. <laughs> we did eight, so yeah, I understand that a little bit. Trip to Mexico. Trip to Mexico. Recovering from neck surgery. Me. She's. She's on it now. <laughs> yeah. See, these are these are other journeys, right? We have we have physical journeys where we travel distances, but we also have journeys of healing. We have mental journeys. We have emotional journeys, we have spiritual journeys. <clears throat> Sometimes we do them on purpose, right? I mean, especially if it's travel related and we're going on a vacation or something. Sometimes we do them on purpose because we want to better ourselves or learn something new. Sometimes they're forced on us. And we have no other choice. And what's interesting is, what I like about, you know, the, the fun part about having Epiphany and, the, and New Year's right around the same time is that we get, to, we have two journeys here, right? We have the journey of the Magi and we have our own journey at the beginning of a new year. And I have asked this every year and I know that very few of you did, but how many people here have resolutions this year? That tracks. Because it's interesting to show that only 9% of people who make resolutions 
keep them. And by the end of the month, half of them are done. Do you know what the main reason for the failure is? This one intrigued me because I'm, you know, I like to think that <clears throat> I think that people are generally good and trying and doing the best they can in their circumstances. But there's a little part of me who's like, you're lazy, <laughs> you know, something like that. The number one reason is that people have not have have not accounted for external factors that will influence them. They think that all they have to do is change themselves and they forget that when they go out into the world there are triggers that are going to set them off and cause a problem. And they have no plan ahead of time to address it. Now, this is like, you know, I don't know if you know this, but it's estimated that the Magi, if they're where we think they're from, <coughs> traveled about 400 miles, which means it was a solid three weeks one way, if it was good travel weather. And still, they pressed on. But it seems like the, the minute weather you know gets a little cloudy for us, we're like, ah, I'm not going out there. <laughs> or even worse, I mean, even just think about it, like in terms of a of a resolution or anything like that. The moment we come across just a little bit of a, a bump in the road, we're like, ah, I'm weak. This isn't gonna work. And we walk away from it. The other main, the second main reason is that um, we try to do it all at once. The way, one of my favorite ways uh, that I saw this put in one of the psychological journals was we try to eat the whole elephant <laughs> and forget that maybe we should take our time <laughs> and progress. This is exactly what happened with the failure of the gleaning, by the way. I tried to eat the whole elephant all at once instead of easing into it. Another aspect that I think falls into this is wanting to do it rather than being told to do it. And I have told a lot of people this over the years. If they ask me what's the what's the first thing that I uh, that I learned in depth about being a pastor, and that first thing that I learned is you can't make anybody do anything they do not want to do. Plain and simple. <clears throat> Sometimes journeys hurt. Um, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking of my own journey through the church, as you all know, raised in the Catholic Church, altar boy. This is actually a very relevant Sunday to my faith journey because I must have made at the age of 16 the New Year's resolution that I would finally sit and listen to what the priest had to say on Sunday during the sermon. And today is also... Yesterday technically was Epiphany, and today is the celebration of the baptism of Christ. So the scripture, of course, was the baptism of Christ, and uh, the priest went on a rant about abortion. 
And I looked at my mom, and I said, I missed the connection with the scripture. And she looked at me, she said, there wasn't one, just be quiet. <laughs> And I looked at her and I said, I'm never coming back. I mean, look at me now, but you know. <laughs> I've said that several times, by the way. I'm never going back to work in the church. Uh huh. God's like, you're adorable, Scott. And when I went to seminary, uh, if I didn't have some crisis of faith every semester, it was pretty close to that. Where you encounter something that you had not thought of, and people put forth excellent arguments for, and you're like, then why am I even here? But then you work through it, and you incorporate it, and you address it in some way, shape, or form, and you find that on the other side, it's actually a better, stronger, deeper faith. And I think that it's a journey that very few people take. I have my suspicions as to what's happened over the years. And since I cannot verify with anything, I'm just going to say that they're suspicions. And part of my suspicion is, first, it's just easy. It's just easy to have someone tell me what to believe. And then I'll do that. And that way I can go about and do the other things that occupy my time throughout the week or the year, or whatever it might be. And I, part of that whole mindset has actually led to where we are now as a church with a capital C. Because the reality is that there are people out there who are not Christian, who are absolutely decimating with scripture and with reason and with logic and with experience, all those things John Wesley said we should rely upon in the formation of our faith, they are using all of those things to just lay bare our fallacies. And they're doing it poorly because what usually happens in those circumstances with any topic, and all you have to do is look around for about, I don't know, three seconds, is to see that when people feel that their core faiths or beliefs or understandings about the world are threatened, what do they do? What? Dig in. They dig in. They just dig the trench deeper and go deeper into it, and they get angry, and they refuse to budge. But here's another interesting thing. The Magi weren't Jews. This had nothing to do with them, but they made a seven-week round trip to fall down and worship at the king of the Jews while we won't listen to anybody outside our own faith because they're just trying to hurt us. Instead of, but we call these magi wise men. We'll refuse, we refuse to hear wisdom outside of ourselves. Isn't that weird? We have a whole Sunday for this. <laughs> for these wise men who had no skin in the game, as it were. Last week as I was talking about what I did and learned and proposed on my sabbatical, one of the things that I pointed out was that a long journey is ahead of the church, of all of them, of all congregations.
And my fear is that we don't even have the stamina of the wise men. To take our time to travel through good weather and bad weather. To look for that star that guides us to Christ wherever he may be. God bless you. And I know that sometimes I think about it and I'm like, I don't know if I have the stamina for that. <clears throat> and I'm younger than most of you. <laughs> and I don't know if a lot of people want to take that journey. It's easier this way. We love cruise control. Man, if we can predict as much of a part of our day, our weeks, our months, our years as possible, oh, we are so happy for that. We just love cruise control. Amen. I don't know if we have the courage the magi had. Or the foresight. Or the I'm trying to think of the, the what, what would we call it? The the willingness to hear that maybe the people that are encouraging us have their own ulterior motives. And maybe it's best we uh, take the back roads home. So that's the question that's before us all, really, all of us, here in this place and across the U.S. Is do we have the stamina and the foresight and the personal choice to actually want this or are we going to dig in and um, keep the status quo The status quo isn't working. And what was it? Let's see. Einstein, I've heard two good quotes in my in my life about the definition of insanity. Einstein's was um, the definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. And then of all things, one of them came out of a video game that I play. Which is, what is insanity except a denial of reality? So, whenever you want, gather your camels and your supplies. And let's find the Christ child out there somewhere in the world and go see him. Amen. Amen. One of those popular understandings about Christ is that we have to wait until he decides to come here again and yet, scripturally, we know that he has said numerous times that he is always here. Whenever you see the least of these, my brothers and sisters, there I am also. Wherever two or three 
of you are gathered in my name, there I am also. And in this celebration of communion, when he says, I am in the bread and the wine. Christ is always coming again. Christ is always present. And so remember that as we reflect on that time when he sat with his disciples one last time for a meal, and he took the bread and blessed it. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, my physical presence given for you. And when the supper was ended, he took the cup and he blessed it. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth fruit from the vine. And he gave it to his disciples, every last one of them, Judas included, and said, Take, drink, this is my blood, my life, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Poured out for you, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it, and remember me. Let us pray. God in heaven, encourage us, rouse us, and if it is your will, or in your mercy, to be as blatantly obvious as giving us a star in the sky. Encourage us, God, on this journey. Push us forward to find you, even if it means we travel for weeks and weeks and find you in the lowest and meanest of places. And we will need your help stirring us from our habits. And so we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we might be for the world Christ's body redeemed by his blood. Amen. The table is set. All are welcome at the table of the Lord. Come, eat, drink, and remember.